cost to consumers. Again, um, and I want to thank the witnesses for coming back. I know that Ms. Lofgren has an event to speak at at 7.30, and Mr. Uh, and my, my, my good friend uh, from Illinois had, a, um, had, a, had to leave at 7, but he's still here. And I appreciate it. So, um, uh, Mr. Burge is not here, but we'll, we'll come back to him later. Ms. Lesko, why don't you ask questions? And again, um, I would urge everybody to be cognizant of the time constraints on our witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I ask questions, I'd like to insert into the record without objection a letter from my colleagues to the chairman requesting an open and transparent process. As been stated before, there's concern that the bill was assigned to 10 committees, but markup was only done in one committee. Well, I, without objection, and, and, they, and you got an open and transparent process, so they should be happy. Thank without you. objection. I don't know who gets that. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Chairman, and uh, my sure. first question is actually going to be for Ms. Lofgren. Um, thank you for being here for a number of hours now. I think it's going to be a number, maybe a number of hours longer. I don't know. Mm, I don't think so. But, well, not, not, yeah, I hope not. Not for this panel, because they have, they have All right, time. fantastic. Yeah. Well, Ms. Lofgren, um, as you have said, California has an independent redistricting commission, and so does Arizona. Right. And um, ours in Arizona was voted in by the voters um, on a ballot measure, and I guess Based on the bill that was reported out of your committee, uh, do you think it's appropriate for the federal government to not only mandate to states what an appropriate uh, commission looks like, but also how the voting takes place, how a vote must be decided? Because in this bill, there's a bunch of specifications of how a majority vote has to be taken. Do you think that's appropriate that the federal government should be telling states what to do on that? I do, and as I'm sure you realize from reading the bill, both Arizona and California's commissions uh, would meet the requirements of this bill. There'd be no change uh, necessary. But this is for redistricting of House seats only, uh, and it really relates to uh, the provisions uh, found in our wonderful Constitution. And I will read the, the sections, Article 1, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. And it says, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations. And that is what we're doing here, to make sure that partisan redistricting is eliminated in the United States and that each member of Congress uh, ha has been selected by their voters without regard to partisanship. And I think that is something that uh, would make for a much um, um, cleaner system uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, neither party has clean hands on this. I mean, in, uh, Mr. Davis suffers from Democratic districting and certain other states from the other. The point is, voters should select their elected members, not the politicians selecting the voters. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, my next question is for Mr. Davis. Um, thank you for being here. Mine is about ballast, ballot harvesting. Uh, that is, there's not a prohibition in this bill for ballot harvesting, as we have kind of touched on before. But I wanted to specifically ask you, um, is there anything in this bill that would prevent a person from, let's say, uh, the Democrat Party, from going into an area uh, that is mostly from their opponent's party uh, and collecting a bunch of ballots and then not turning them in. No, nothing in this bill would prohibit that. And that's very concerning for me. And that's why the state of Arizona has prohibited uh, ballot, ballot harvesting. And we have touched on before about what happened in North Carolina. And in, in North Carolina, they prohibited ballot harvesting. But as uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Lofgren said that it's not prohibited in California. So would something like what happened in North Carolina have been stopped in California? Well, I, I, I obviously um, we saw 
many races in California decided uh, many days after the election, uh, ballots upon ballots coming in. And there were instances where even House administration observers observed the same individual in a certain race that was part of a campaign uh, that ballot harvested and then was also an observer during the counting of those ballots. It, it's a, we want everybody to have a chance to vote. And we believe in this, in, in the current state of affairs right now, uh, to get registered to vote and to be able to cast your vote, we have so many more options than when you and I started voting uh, just a few short years ago. The problem we have is when you know that a process has been corrupted, like in North Carolina, where we will now have a special election, where likely you know, millions upon millions upon millions of dollars will come into this North Carolina special election so one party can win that seat over the other. It was, it's that special election has taken place because somebody took advantage of the system with this, that was in place. If we know it's illegal and we know what they did was wrong, then why wouldn't we outlaw that process to make sure that it doesn't happen somewhere else? Well, I, I agree. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on Mr. Davis. Oh, you're good. Um, I just wanted to note that the, uh, the hypothetical outlined by uh, the gentle lady from Arizona is illegal. I mean, that would be illegal today and would be illegal if this bill becomes law. And that in terms of uh, California, uh, there is a, an additional prohibition and criminal penalty <laughs> for uh, interfering uh, uh, with the uh, ballots themselves. I will say, and I want to talk about California just briefly, because we have a system in California where if you put your ballot in the mail election day, it still gets counted. And so if it takes four or five days for the, you know, for the ballot to actually be delivered to the registrar of voters, it still gets counted. And it's also a very lengthy procedure because you have to go to the microfiche, compare the signature on the outside of the ballot with what's on the registration thing. If there's a question, there's a process where you have to have two people and you have to notify the end of it. It's very lengthy. And you can let someone who's not your relative take your ballot, um, but the vast majority of ballots that were late were delivered by the U.S. Postal Service, and, that, and it took a long time to count, but in the end, we got an accurate count, and there, there were no challenges to the counts made, and both parties and all the candidates, including House administration from both sides of the aisle, had observers, and there was no uh, question ever raised as to the validity of the count. Um, my next question, Mr. Chairman, is also for Mr. Davis. Um, the staff has uh, helped me determine how much money just the um, Democrats on this Rules Committee would get from public financing uh, if this bill were in effect, and it's uh, $6.3 million in addition to whatever else uh, of fundraising uh, they, they got. Um, and I have to tell you, in my own instance, I had uh, four elections last year, and my opponent under this bill would have received another $4.3 million um, from public financing. Uh, I would have received another $3.3 million from public financing for a total of an additional $7.6 million. I have to tell you that every single, uh, just about every single person I talked to was so sick of TV commercials, campaign commercials, campaign signs, robocalls, with the amount of money that we spent. Can you imagine uh, their disgust if we added another $7.6 million just you know, in, in my election, let alone all of the Arizona candidates? My question to you, uh, Mr. Davis, is do you think this is a good use of public money and do you think all of HR1 is designed to help the Democrat Party, I, I certainly, Democrat candidates? Yeah, I, I certainly do. This is, uh, and I mentioned in my opening statement that this is a bill that is designed to basically protect and fund Democratic campaigns. Um, that's what's unfortunate, because a bill that's, that 
is supposed to make sure that everybody gets a chance to vote in this country. A bill to ensure that we have better processes in place for redistricting should not be hijacked by this six to one uh, government matching program that has, has been discussed here uh, for the majority of the, the entire hearing today. Uh, it's a big, it, it's, it's a major concern. And frankly, I go back to what I said earlier. I have not had one person in my district or out here come up to me outside of the sponsors of this bill and the, the colleagues we have who've argued for this bill that have said we need more money in all of our, all of our congressional campaigns. I made the comment during the markup that my race alone would have garnered an extra $6 million. My opponent would have gotten $4 million of that, and I would have gotten $2 million because the Democrats did a much better job uh, using Act Blue and platforms to have money come from areas where there were not competitive races into areas where there are competitive races like yours, like mine, like Mr. Woodall's. I, my opponent had so much money to spend, she rented an entire city block for her victory party. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry it didn't work out, but I'm here. We don't need any more money in politics. I don't need any more money in this race. All this is going to do is ensure that, that, the, ensure that political operatives, broadcasters, members of the media get more money from more campaigns. We're not achieving the goal that the Democrats said they want, which is to get money out of politics. And, and that's what's most unfortunate, Ms. Lesko. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis, and, and I, I agree with you. In fact, I had uh, one of those telephone town halls today, and I asked uh, my constituents if, if they supported, it was like press one, if you support this bill, press two, if you oppose this bill, and I think it was 92% of my constituents on the call opposed uh, this bill because they don't want, one of the reasons is they don't want public financing used for campaigns, and they certainly don't want to see more signs, more TV commercials. They, believe me, they were sick of it. In Arizona, we had so many TV commercials that it jacked up the price of each commercial to a ridiculous amount. I mean, you nonstop TV commercials, um, and nobody that I've talked to wants to see more of that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, being mindful of the time of the two witnesses here. Anybody on this side have any questions? Okay, uh, Mr. Burgess, I just, I, as I mentioned before, um, Mr. Uh, Davis had to leave at 7, and Ms. Uh, Lofgren had to leave, needs to give a speech at 7.30. So I, I, if you could try to... Okay. Yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> we'll be able to wrap this up in, in, in pretty short order. Um, Ms. Lofkin, let me just ask you on, uh, um, on a couple of things uh, on this bill. Well, first off, does federal law currently permit, uh, I'm sorry, does federal law currently prohibit intimidating, threatening, or coercing any person for registering to vote or voting or attempting to register to vote or urging or aiding any person to register to vote or attempt to register to vote? Does federal law already prohibit that? intimidation I I don't know offhand certainly that is a proviso in this bill ordinarily registration matters are matters of state law except this will change because we are talking about registration for federal elections and we want to make sure that nobody is intimidated coerced threatened when it comes to registration for federal elections well, my understanding is there are already penalties for that type of activity, uh, monetary fine, and prison time. Has the Department of Justice indicated that somehow current law is insufficient to prosecute this type of behavior? The Department of Justice did not communicate with us one way or the other, Mr. Burgess. So, Mr. Davis, do you agree with Ms. Lofgren's assessment? I, I, I don't know how I can agree or disagree with her assessment that they didn't, uh, they didn't reach out to him, but my question would be, why wouldn't the authors of this bill that would have uh, that a bill that, you know, obviously would address many of the issues under the Committee of Jurisdiction of Judiciary with the Justice Department, why didn't the authors of the bill reach out to the Justice Department and ask if these are redundant procedures or not? 
Well, one of the reasons I asked is several years ago, Frank Wolf and I took this very issue to Chairman Conyers when he was Chairman of the Judiciary. Uh, there was an election where there was some intimidation that was widely reported in the press that occurred in the 2008 election. And we took those allegations that were part of the general public knowledge to Mr. Conyers, and he assured us that it was already in violation of federal law to do that, and if it had happened, those people would surely be prosecuted. We could find no evidence that they were prosecuted, so we sort of reached a dead end. But again, it's, I think it's already there. But you said we, that would have been the purview of the markup in the hearing in the Judiciary Committee. Yeah, I, I don't believe, unless I, I'm corrected by the chairperson, that the House Administration Committee would have any jurisdiction over the provisions in DOJ that the DOJ has to follow. I, I think that's correct, but the bill also does provide a private right of action for individuals who have been aggrieved. And I think that should be something supported by both parties, because in the instance, I don't know the details of, of what uh, you sent to Mr. Conyers, but there has been very little enforcement of these rights through, through agencies. And if, if you're aggrieved, you need a remedy. A right without a remedy is no right whatsoever. So we've augmented the opportunity to get justice here in the bill. So um, let me just ask you that, uh, and I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, but reading of the text of H.R. 1, it adds the terms hinder or interfere to the Voting Rights Act. Is that correct, Ms. Lofgren? Um, I don't know what page you're on. I... Can you give me the page? Title 1, one? subtitle D, section 1301. <laughs> Could you tell me the page? Title I, Subtitle D, Section 1301. Section 1301 of, of Title I. Let me... Is the staff find that? So we'll be on the same page. Okay, um, I have it now. What, it, what is your question, sir? So it adds the term hinder or interfere to the Voting Rights Act. Yes. No. It prohibits deceptive practices and prevents voter intimidation. So page 99. Numerous hindering or interfering with or pre preventing voting or registering to vote? Yes. So Correct. Are those terms defined in the bill? No, but they're defined in case law. Okay, and you're comfortable that there would be a, a be able to draw the correct parallel with case law? I believe so. I mean, there's a a very large body of law relating to election law in this country. Well, since they're not defined in the bill, and we would be depending on case law, that I guess there is concern that there would be implications that would not be covered in the language of the, of the bill. Mr. Davis said at any point during the hearing or markup of this bill, have you been assured that this that, that this would not be uh, uh, much more far-reaching than what Ms. Lofgren assigns with previous case law? No, not that I'm aware of and not that, uh, not that any, anything I can recall in our markup. And I would, I would remind uh, our colleagues here on this committee that the Voting Rights Act and uh, changes and reauthorizations have traditionally been very bipartisan. And as we've already noted, this process has been anything but bipartisan. Mr. Burgess, I want to make sure, I mean, the section says hindering, interfering with, or preventing voting or registering to vote. No person, whether acting under color of law or otherwise, shall intentionally hinder, interfere with, or prevent another person from voting, registering to vote, 
or aiding another person to vote or register to vote in an election described in paragraph five of federal elections. Is that, are you concerned about that? That remains undefined in the text of the, in the text of the bill. Well, I, I disagree, but I just want to make sure we were looking at the same thing. So, Mr. Davis, you referenced back blue a minute ago, and I don't think there's any disagreement about getting dark money out of politics. Uh, I got to tell you, um, I've never seen the type of non-disclosure that occurred with. Act Blue in this last election. I mean, there would just be lump sum designations from Act Blue, large amounts of money, yes, ostensibly drawn from small sources, but I don't know where the, doc the documentation for that did not occur in any FEC report that I was able to find in the elections that I studied. Is that something that you encountered as well? Well, it is, and, and judging by the donations that were made through Act Blue that were above the threshold of itemization, uh, in my race alone, my opponent raised uh, um, over a million dollars uh, out of areas like New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, California, New York, and other major metropolitan areas, money coming into my district uh, with no connection to my district whatsoever. Um, and, and that's unfortunate because it seems to me that because of this advantage, because of this small dollar advantage that the Democrats uh, figured out that they had, that their solution is to now add six times the money to that on the backs of taxpayers. Well, that was going to be my question. Does, does do those dollars raised, if they get you to the threshold of $50,000 uh, to, to allow entrance into this six to one match, is that, is, is that correct? Is that this undisclosed money would, would actually get you to that point? Yes. Uh, Mr. Burgess, I think there's, some confusion here because Act Blue is already required by federal law to report the details of every single contribution that comes into and out of its platform to the Federal Elections Commission. It is considered a conduit under federal law for individual contributions uh, through its uh, platform. It's a payment processor, and that's why we know how much money they've processed. Now, but the. Let me, let me stop you there for a minute, Mr. Davis. Please feel free to way in here, I was unable to find any place on the FEC data that was available in my race where there was actually a breakdown. Everything else, small dollar contributions uh, disclosed, and that's great, it should be transparency, but then there would be $73,000 from Act Blue. Um, hard to know, uh, your assessment was that that was money that perhaps was not in your district that was well, the, being the, delivered into this candidacy, yeah, is that correct? The money that was disclosed, we saw a clear uh, clear pattern of money coming from uh, major metropolitan areas outside of Illinois' 13th district. I, I you know, again, and I've, I've heard the arguments about the ample time to, to use this to, to study all the issues. I will tell you, I remain confused that this oh, no. is not a, uh, I don't know where those dollars came from. Again, when we look on the FEC report that was reported in my race, there would just be lump sum designations with no breakdown as to what zip code, who the, who the individual was, what the level of contribution was. So I guess my concern is knowing that, do those contributions, if they push someone over the $50,000 limit to participate in the six to one match, is that okay? that those funds come through an Act Blue designation? The, the Act Blue... No, just, I mean, just in this sense, for, for that matching purpose. They those... already report every contribution. They're required to report every contribution. Candidates are not required to report contributions under $200 under current law. However, if they participated in the matching program, they would be required to disclose those donors as well. Well, maybe it's a weakness in the system, uh, but it is very, very difficult to get that granular data out of any of the websites that are publicly available at present time. And uh, to the extent that this is a problem that you all work on in your committee, perhaps, um, and, and if there's just simply another place that I should be looking for that information, I would appreciate you sharing 
the information, but right now, I don't think it is intuitively obvious to the casual observer where those dollars, from where they are derived. Um, Mr. Mr. Burgess, if I could add a comment, I think it's indicative that the process to fund this six to one match program has been changed in less than a week. And it's just sowing more confusion to the taxpayers and which is why I would hope that this bill could be slowed down and go back to the committees of jurisdiction and have a more thorough approach before we're forced <laughs> to vote this Friday on a 622 page bill. Yeah, um, well, I, I, I share your frustration there. We've heard the other arguments that there's been plenty of time to look at this. This is something that your committee, this is, this is work that your committee does. So mm -hmm. again, my, my ask to you, separate and apart from this bill, I don't think it's readily apparent, again, that it's not intuitively obvious to the casual observer that I can go and, and derive where those funds are, are coming from, where, what zip codes they're coming from, let alone what, what persons they're coming from. It raises the question, is, the, is, is everything absolutely above board here? When people ask me that, I don't know how to answer the question. Let's uh, just, because I know your time is, is, is limited, can I just ask you a, on the congressional ethics reform part of this? It's, uh, um, and I don't disagree with the intention and the, uh, that people should have to, uh, the members of Congress would have to, that reimbursement is required. I believe that section A of subtitle A requiring members of Congress to reimburse Treasury on page 601 of the of the bill. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm just not reading it correctly, but it almost sounds as if that would be a retrospective or retroactive uh, look. Is there a, um, it says the effective date, the amendments made by this section shall take effect as if included in the enactment of the Congressional Accountability Act of 1995. So are these reimbursements retroactive? No. Okay, I'll, I'll be happy to accept that answer. Um, Again, I'm just a simple country doctor, so as I, as I read this, it looks like it goes back to 95 and everything. Well, it's the act of 95. But the effective date of the amendments of this section, it's like they were amendments in 1995, and now we're several years past that date. Well, I guess the other question that comes up, and, and again, perhaps not part of this bill, but it is the jurisdiction of your committee, and you all worked on this in the, in the last Congress. You spent considerable time working on uh, what is correct and what is the proper disclosure. At some point, I hope the House Committee on Administration will advise members. When I was in, uh, in business, when I served on the board of a local hospital, we had, you could purchase things like director's liability insurance to, to protect against uh, uh, a claim made. Do we, as members of Congress, need to purchase that type of director's liability insurance for our offices? And if so, have, has the committee provided us any direction in the type of policy that would be advised and, and where to find that? Can MRA funds be used to purchase that? On that point, we did have a brief meeting, myself and Mr. Davis, uh, uh, Ms. Spear and Bradley Byrne, uh, with the House Employment Council to sort through some of these issues. And uh, that has, we haven't reached a conclusion on every one of them, but that is actively being worked in a completely bipartisan basis to try and reach conclusions to give to members on those questions. But yet, we are now with the passage of this bill on Friday, if it were to become law, which it won't, but if it were, uh, I mean, I. Obviously, I've got questions about it. I suspect other members would have questions as well. What about a payment that is made on behalf of a member of Congress, uh, not on the Congressional Accountability Act, but through <coughs> some other structure, uh, another, another um, commission that the member of Congress might serve on where there's a, an allegation and a payment made to an employee who thought they were wronged? 
it uh, is that covered under this act? No, this is a Congressional Accountability Act of 1995. Okay, well, we're all aware of those stories where that has happened in, in other jurisdictions within the purview of members of Congress. Does the House Administration Committee look into that? Is that, or is that just beyond your, your, your scope and designation? I, I don't believe that's within our jurisdiction, sir. Well, again, we might, we might revisit that. I, you know, Mr. Chairman, I'll just say, and, and, and I thank you for indulging me in the time, um, and one of the complaints that I hear at home from constituents is, look, the Democrats really don't tell us what they're for. They're just uh, we're, we're viscerally opposed to this president, and everything they do is going to be against this president. But I think with this bill, H.R. 1, and Mr. Davis, you referenced that you said in your opening statement. I apologize that I, that I missed that, but uh, this, is, this bill is to protect Democratic campaigns. That's the intent of this bill. And I, it has become more obvious to me with your, your, your proper elucidation as we've gone through the, the Q&A on this. So like the Green New Deal, like the single-payer health care bill that we'll uh, hear in the Rules Committee, it won't come through Energy and Commerce, my understanding is going to be done through the Rules Committee. So it's pretty clear what the agenda is. And the agenda is certainly not on the side of the people, but it's on the side of the government. And, you know like to still believe in that quaint notion that we have a government because of the consent of the governed. And it's bills like this, bills like the Green New Deal, bills like the single-payer health care, that lead me to believe that uh, it's no longer with the consent of the governed, it's with the consent of the government. Many of the things that are done in here take power away from the states. The states created the federal government. It wasn't the other way around. So it does seem to me that the focus is, is not where it should be, which is on people. We, we should be concerned about the economy. We should be concerned about jobs. It used to be every election that was run, people were concerned about, I want to rebuild the middle class. Well, by golly, we've got a president who's rebuilt the middle class, and most of us seem to be insensitive to that fact that he should get any credit for that at all. Mr. Chairman, I recognize that you're able to pass this bill out of the Rules Committee. I, I recognize that you're going to be able to get the votes to pass this I bill so. on the floor. Uh, President has already issued a veto statement. I don't know what the United States Senate will do. If there's any fairness in the world, the Senate will give you just as much trouble as it gave us. Uh, I worry that now, now they'll be more accommodating, but if this bill were to get to the President's desk, he will veto it, and he would not be able to survive, would not be able to muster a veto override. So we're going through an interesting exercise, but part of our job, and the reason this is so important, part of our job is to notify and amplify those things that are before the American people, because unlike the constituents in Ms. Lesko's district, I'm not sure the constituents around the country really understand what it is that it's at stake tonight, what it is we're talking about, what it is that Mr. Davis has so cor correctly elucidated is, is contained within this bill. And I appreciate the indulgence, and I'll yield back. Well, and I will disagree with you. I, I do think the American people know what's going on. Um, and, um, and I think they, based on, if, if they've been observing this hearing, know that we don't share the same goals here. Um, we're not both committed to end the dominance of big money in politics. I mean, you had control of this institution for eight years. You didn't do anything. We saw a proliferation of big money and corporate money uh, into our political system, a proliferation of dark money. Proliferation into our, of activity. And, and, and into, into our political system. I don't think we share the goal of protecting uh, the rights of every single person in this country to vote, because if we did, uh, during your eight years in, in, in control of this Congress, you would have done something when we saw secretaries of states and governors in other states uh, intentionally try to deny people the right to vote and try to suppress uh, voter turnout uh, in elections. And I don't think we share the, the goal of, 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 of restoring integrity to our elections, you know, or cracking down on corruption. Um, I mean, this, uh, people get it. I mean, they're sick and tired of big money in politics. They're sick and tired you know, of, of, uh, of governors and secretaries of states, you know, trying to disenfranchise voters, uh, trying to take away their right to vote. People have had it, so they know what's going on here. Um, and I think people have a choice. You obviously disagree uh, with this bill, uh, and that's great. You can debate against it and vote against it. Uh, but some of us actually think it's time for a change. Um, and I want to tell you, um, I think this is this issue is not does not not only resonates amongst Democratic voters and by the way, Ms. Lesko, we're the Democratic Party, not the Democrat Party, but also amongst Republican voters and independent voters. So I think people have had enough. 
Um, and what we are doing is delivering on a promise uh, that we're going to restore some integrity and some accountability and some transparency to our system, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, we look forward to a vigorous debate on the floor. I thank you both for being here. Uh, I apologize it went on so long, but it's been very, very informative, um, and you can you are free to leave. Uh, so I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. We're now going to uh, call up our. Uh, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, we're going to call up our, our next panel, um, Representative Shawazi, uh, Re Representative Ice, uh, Representative uh, Davidson, and Representative Green. Um, and uh, let me uh, let me say that, um, as some of you know, uh, we changed some rules uh, some rules this year, and we are requiring hearings or markups, something that this bill complied with. We are requiring 72 hours to read the bill. Again, something that this bill uh, complied with, uh, but we also said we would give preference to amendments sponsored by 20 members from each party, and part of that preference means that you get to go first, Mr. Swazi. Uh, and um, uh, so I would, um, you know, like to remind all of you: if you have statements, you can provide them to our stenographer, uh, and uh, we will begin with uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the members of the committee. I know you're going to have a very long night. You've got 150 amendments to go through. I'm very excited to be first of all the amendments, and I will, know it, given the I will try and set a precedent of trying to be as brief as possible. I was joined by uh, Congressman Gottheimer, who's the co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, Congressman Tom Reed, who's the Republican co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, and Vice Chairman of the Problem Solvers Caucus, Brian Fitzpatrick, who's also my co-lead on this bill. Uh, the reason that we are going first is because we have received a preference from the Rules Committee because we have 24 Democrats and 20 Republicans that have co-sponsored this bill. This is something the Problem Solvers negotiated uh, with the leadership, uh, that if you can get 20 Democrats and 20 Republicans to co-sponsor an amendment, it would receive preference from this committee. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, especially uh, from, on behalf of everyone from the Problem Solvers Caucus, because we've enjoyed working with you and your staff to not only negotiate this 2020 rule uh, as part of our Break the Gridlock proposal to enhance transparency and bipartisanship in the Congress, uh, but also now as authors of the First Amendment to ever receive preferential treatment of the, under the 2020 rule. Our bipartisan amendment, uh, number 112, with 24 Democrats and 20 Republican co-sponsors, would require the Federal Elections Commission to conduct an audit after each federal election cycle to determine the incidence of illicit foreign money in the election. Campaign finance law has loopholes, leaving the American electoral process susceptible to illicit funding from foreign nationals, corporations, and government. Foreign money easily influences our elections by passing funds through shell corporations, U.S. subsidiaries, trade associations, and shell corporations. This is of great concern to me, and more importantly, uh, my co-sponsors and to the American people. 89% of voters express concern that foreigners are able to donate money in secret to federal campaigns. 79% of voters believe foreign influence in American elections, quote, very often or somewhat often. This issue is not just of importance to Democrats when discussing the need for campaign finance reform. The ability to spend foreign money in our elections was the top reason, top testing reason by Republican respondents to overturn Citizens United. Support for undisclosed money, which can lead to foreign money in elections, gave independents and Republicans doubts about a candidate's more than any other issue uh, overall. Regardless of party, we must all work together to stop the flow of foreign money into our elections so we may safeguard our democracy. Under our proposed amendment, within 180 days of an election, the FEC will submit to Congress a report containing audit results and recommendations to address the presence of illicit foreign money. I commend you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff, and this committee, rank Mr. Ranking Member, and everyone on this committee, for taking this rule into consideration, and thank you to all the working members of the Problem Solvers Caucus and other pragmatic members uh, to foster a bipartisan, inclusive process. Confidence in our electoral process is essential to faith in our government institutions. I urge the, this committee to add this bipartisan amendment to H.R. 1 so we can end one of the largest vulnerabilities to our electoral process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Heiss, uh, you waited here patiently. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually have three amendments. I don't know how you want to do you want me to do all three. all three of them. OK, thank you very much. And I appreciate you allowing me to be here. This first one is uh, from Whip Scalise, myself and Mike Johnson. It's uh, been passed a couple of times previously in the House. Uh, did not go through the Senate, but the Free Speech Fairness Act. Uh, basically, this is an amendment that will allow pastors and religious leaders across the nation to address their membership without encumbrance by the federal government. The First Amendment to our Constitution, as we all know, states explicitly that Congress shall make no law that abridges the freedom of speech. And yet, from since 1954, our government has restricted that freedom in churches, synagogues, and mosques across the country. I myself, a pastor for 25 years prior to coming here, personally experienced this. Thomas Jefferson said, that to take a single step beyond the boundaries specially drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible to definition. And what we're trying to do is return to the intended definition of the First Amendment and free our religious congregations from the uh, icy glaze of the IRS. H.R. 1, the bill before us in this committee espouses the ideals of freedom of speech. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have stated that this bill is about giving every citizen of our country the right to express that freedom. I wholeheartedly agree that the right of freedom of speech must be respected by our government. Because my amendment seeks to protect the rights of free speech while providing safeguards for the delineation of the nonprofit sector in our tax code, I strongly believe that it deserves our vote, and I yield back on that. Uh, by the way, that is uh, Amendment 83. Uh, amendment 122, uh, this amendment is very, very simple. It simply says that no individual may be registered to vote unless they have provided a written affirmation under penalty of perjury that they are a citizen of the United States. While simple, this is a critical addition to this legislation. Under the provisions of H.R. 1, states would be required to automatically register people to vote by transferring all their information held by government agencies to election officials unless someone proactively opts out. But here's the problem. Non-citizens use government services too. Their information will be transferred to election officials for voter registration right along with everyone else's. The only safeguard under H.R. 1 to prevent an illegal alien from being automatically registered is if the alien proactively declines. Given that folks, uh, that these particular individuals are in the United States illegally, uh, typically they don't want to try to call attention to themselves. And so do we really believe that they're going to deliberately declare themselves by admitting they're here illegally and therefore ineligible to vote in federal elections. But to me, that just flies in the face of common sense. Uh, the people of the United States uh, who are here illegally should not vote in our federal elections. Uh, that used to be widely accepted and is still against federal law. Encouraging the registration of persons not eligible to vote dilutes the voting power of American citizens. And I hope my colleagues here tonight will make this amendment in order and allow the House to consider this simple improvement to H.R. 1. The third amendment is number 125, um, the, dealing with the Office of Government Ethics, uh, which of course is a prevention and education agency. OGE is responsible for ensuring compliance with ethics requirement such as financial disclosures and conflict of interest rules. Yet HR1 wants to turn OGE into an investigative office by granting the director the authority to subpoena information and records. My amendment would remove the granting of subpoena authority to the OGE director. OGE already has the power to request needed information from federal agencies and agencies are required to comply with these requests under the Ethics and Government Act. The Office of Government Ethics does not require Sabina authority. Furthermore, during the Trump administration, OGE has been openly hostile towards the Republican administration. OGE has become a partisan actor 
His former director, Walter Schaub, clashed openly with the president, as we all know. OGB went so far as even using its official Twitter account in an attempt to force President-elect Trump to divest his business interests. We do not want to allow an office that has been so partisan to have the legal authority to issue subpoenas and open the door to overt harassment of executive branch employees. I should note that agency inspector generals currently have the authority to subpoena information and documents from the agencies they oversee. IGs should continue to retain this power. Uh, so I urge again uh, the committee to make this amendment in order and the, allow the full House opportunity to weigh in on this matter. Thank you very I yield much, back. Mr. Thank Mr. you. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, ranking member and all of the members of this August committee. I have a very simple amendment. It does not change voter registration requirements. It does not require participation of an education agency. What it does is what we've been doing in Texas since 1985, and that is it allows school districts to provide voter registration information twice a year to young children, children who are eligible to vote. Um, it's a common sense amendment. It uh, will help us to inculcate our young people into the process uh, immediately upon being eligible to vote. I can say a lot more, but because I have a great deal of respect for you and what you are doing, I will let this be my terse and laconic statement. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Davidson. Thank you. I with apologies to the uh, committee and to uh, my colleagues who have very short amendments, uh, I have a fair number, I think 13. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today on this very important legislation. Uh, federalism is the heart of the system our founders created. Can you hold one second before you go? Um, let, me, let me just see. Does anybody have any questions for the three uh, people who just testified? Um, or can we let them go? All right, well, uh, we, well we, we, we're going to wait until after Mr. Davidson finishes then. I just, I, I, the, the kind of the rule here is that if anyone has any questions, uh, um, who's your question for? Well, all right, one, we'll make an exception here just because we'll try to make it easier. Just a quick one. I, I was curious whether or not the foreign, I was looking it up in the amendment, but I, I couldn't pull it out, but the foreign entity, does that include uh, dollars spent by a foreign government or is it just private donations? Yes, it would also include, uh, it would be any illicit foreign money, with that would, and money from a foreign government would be illicit foreign money. And that would be uh, involve potentially our security uh, uh, apparatus, national and national security, national intelligence, and to determine whether or not they've been able to determine whether or not federal or uh, foreign foreign governments have participated this in would be some an, way in influencing our elections. It would be an audit by the FEC. It wouldn't be of every single election. Obviously, it would be a randomized audit to look for illicit f money and money from federal government. Foreign governments would also be illicit foreign contributions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You, got, you guys can go. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. And not that your, your amendments aren't great, but I just figured they, you know, you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I appreciate it, Chairman. Actually, uh, it makes me feel a little better about uh, not delaying these folks further. So thank right, you. You got a whole bunch of people waiting. So just so you. Just so I you understand. Know okay. Uh, I'd be happy for the committee to to rule uh, HR one out of order and make my amendments unnecessary by unanimous consent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, federalism is an important part of the system our founders created. And this bill uh, certainly impinges on it. We have differences of opinion, opinion about how it does. Uh, but in the spirit of uh, trying to make it better, I've offered a host of amendments. I'll try to be brief in summarizing them and to why I think they're important. And I look forward to answering whatever questions the committee may have. I'd also emphasize the point uh, made in the letter from Chairman Meadows and Ms. Lesko entered into the record, which is that this bill has been marked up by a single committee with only three members of the minority party. It would be a mistake to restrict the people's 
representatives in the People's House from participating in the amendment process for the For the People Act. So I'm urging an expansive amendment process. As to the particular amendments, uh, I'll take it in order by divisions in Division A. I would eliminate the federal holiday provision. My understanding is from sitting in this room that the manager's amendment does that. Uh, it's, uh, amendment uh, 29. It would replace uh, the federal holiday mandate with a sense of Congress that election day should occur on a weekend. This would encourage participation uh, and access. And of course, in many states like Ohio, there's uh, ample period for open voting, which does include weekends. Uh, but this would be uh, a certainly different approach than the uh, mandated federal holiday. Um, my next amendment uh, is 43. <coughs> And it exempts states that have seen large increases in voter turnout over the past few elections uh, from the automatic voter registration mandate in this bill. The goal, as I understand it, is to increase political participation. We should reward states that have seen that rise and not burden them with additional mandates. Um, and in many states, we've seen more than 5% increase in participation. Um, we are all concerned. Let's see my next amendment is uh, 123. We are all concerned with foreign interference in our election process. The presence of large numbers of illegal aliens and non-citizens in a con given congressional district should be cause for concern. And it results in malapportionment by counting non-citizens uh, for apportionment. States like Ohio, which have lower populations of non-citizens, are uh, deprived of representation, and states like California or other border states are rewarded with additional apportionment. Uh, one person, one vote is a principle we should strive for uh, where the Constitution permits it, and um, this is the spirit of that amendment. The next amendment <clears throat> is uh, 138, and um, continuing in that vein, it would require documentary proof of citizenship at the point of registration. We've seen in Texas that there is some legitimate concern with illegal voting, illegal alien voting. The automatic voter registration mandate in this bill may worsen this concern, which is why the underlying bill nods to this issue by ensuring aliens who are registered to vote automatically are not held liable. My amendment would ensure that this isn't an issue going forward and that the votes of Americans are not diluted by illegal votes. Um, the next amendment is 173. Mm, sorry, 170. Sorry, 176 that I'm going to speak about. 176, I'm speaking out of order here. 176, this bill requires pre-registration for 16-year-olds. If an individual is registered, there is a chance uh, he or she may vote. My amendment on this topic would ensure that 16-year-olds are not required by federal law to be pre-registered until election officials certify that there are sufficient safeguards in place. Uh, to be clear, some states have long experience with pre-registration, and this amendment would do nothing to affect regimes in states where it is already the practice. It simply um, gives states uh, an ample period to go through uh, safeguards and uh, protect the integrity of the registration process. Um, next, uh, I have an additional amendment that would make it clear that it is perjury to falsify information on voter registration form. That is uh, 173. While requiring states to verify the information provided on those forms and requiring that suitable federal assistance be provided to states in order to ensure that they are able to do that. It strikes me as a relatively common sense reform uh, as it is already the law. However, there are some states where, for example, uh, motor voter registration has enabled people to be registered who should not have been registered. So there are some current flaws in those existing safeguards. Uh, next, in uh, regards to provisional ballots, this is uh, Amendment 170. The bill contains a requirement that states adopt a method used in California, which allows a voter to cast a ballot 
anywhere in the state and have that ballot counted. In 2016, the latest year for which a full survey is available, the Elections Assistance Commission estimates that 2.5 million provisional ballots were cast, nearly half of which were cast in California. Only four states saw provisional ballots cast in excess of 100,000, Arizona, California, New York, and Ohio, my home state. All four of these states allow a ballot that was cast by a voter in the wrong precinct to be counted, either partially or in full. Similar, state, similar large states, such as Texas and Florida, that reject casting provisional ballots uh, not cast in the correct precincts, uh, see many fewer accepted provisional ballots as well as many fewer cast provisional ballots. Uh, it takes a complex system of safeguards to ensure that a voter only votes in the correct elections uh, for the precinct in which they're eligible to. For example, if they vote in uh, the north part of a state uh, when they're actually residents in the south part and supposed to vote there, uh, they would have different um, you know, congressional district, for example. They may be voting for the same senators, but they would vote for a different member of Congress, and that safeguard uh, is supposed to be at the heart of this bill. Uh, so while we care about access, we certainly care about the integrity of the election. Um, the amendment would, uh, would allow states uh, to follow a more restrictive uh, model. Uh, so let me sum up Division A amendments by suggesting that Democrats are very concerned with access to the ballot. I think that they are wise to be concerned and share concern about access. Uh, but access has to be balanced uh, with integrity against um, ensuring that the elections are timely and accurate. I believe the balance of this bill is set far away from integrity, and I would urge the members of the committee to allow their own members to determine how this balance might be, be, might be set by allowing a vote on my Division A amendments. Um, next, I'm very concerned that the provisions under the campaign finance transparency uh, portion will have on First Amendment rights of organizations uh, and individuals to engage in issue advocacy that's far removed from campaign-related electioneering communications. It seems that um, that concern is shared by uh, one of the foremost civil liberties organizations, the ACLU. I have an amendment that would remove the Disclose Act subtitle. Under Disclose Act organizations ranging uh, the gamut in the political spectrum from Planned Parenthood to the NRA would be required to publicly disclose the names and addresses of their top donors merely for mentioning the name of a candidate. Um, the vague standards applies to these issues, issue ads will force organizations to think twice. Uh, it has a chilling effect. Um, I think we've covered that extensively earlier. I have another amendment that would remove the stand by every ad section. That's 167. Um, this subtitle repeats all of the same privacy and First Amendment violations as disclosed with the added effect distracting from an organization's message and potentially having donors listed on ads to which they disagree. So, for example, many of us donate money to, uh, to organizations and we agree with their overall uh, mission or we wouldn't support them, but in a given case, we may uh, not agree with the particular issue. So, uh, a donor's name would be listed in an ad and they may be in complete disagreement with the ad listed. It would give the perception uh, that's there. So, it is a a significant impact on that person who's disclosed uh, speech. Uh, I also have a, an amendment uh, to remove the restrictions on online political speech. This section adopts a broad definition of paid content such that organizations that pays a staffer to manage its online presence uh, and merely mentions a candidate in the course of an issue advocacy could run afoul of disclaimer and trigger reporting requirements for the entire organization. Um, Next, uh, if you look at 159, um, in the Financial Services Committee of Jurisdiction, where Mr. Perlmutter and I serve, uh, the SEC provision concerns me. Uh, securities laws have a place uh, in the United States since the New Deal. They're in place to protect investors and consumers. Uh, they're there to prevent <coughs> fraud and ensure orderly functioning of financial markets. They're not in place to achieve social ends. And uh, as Hester Pierce said so recently, as recently as today, Mary Jo White, an Obama appointee, refused to issue this rule. And since 2005, regulations of this type have been defunded in the relevant appropriations bill. Why would we go back on that? Um, 
in uh, Amendment 160, I have something similar working on the IRS in 501c4 provisions. The IRS record on these social welfare groups is horrible. In fact, we saw a major scandal under the previous administration where they had to withdraw rulemaking on their political activity that was opposed to by groups across the political spectrum and their donor disclosure rules was not in keeping with the spirit of free association. We shouldn't go backward here and that's what my amendment would get at. Finally, I have three separate amendments which would strike elements of the bill that exempt political parties from additional disclaimer and disclosure requirements. I would urge particularly that those in um, say the progressive camp of the Democratic Party or those in the blue dog camp of the Democratic Party to consider what it might mean for party money to be much less restricted by campaign finance laws and what it would mean for enforcement of orthodox party, party views. So nonconformity to the party uh, could be uh, severely punished and uh, restricted. I'm a conservative and I have grave concerns about this, the way this would affect um, conservatives. It could uh, um, force parties to become more uniform, less uh, argumentative uh, in debate, and um, it would basically keep more of America feeling like Congress doesn't represent them or people like them. Fewer Americans' ideo ideologies would be represented in Congress, and uh, that seems to go against the spirit of the bill. In fact, I believe it would make the spirit of the bill uh, far worse than what uh, is purported. So I thank you for your patience uh, and tolerance of these numerous amendments and hope we can accelerate it by unanimous consent of their adoption. Thank you. Well, Mr. Let me just, I just want to make one point and uh, then before we go to the next uh, witness. Um, you know, I want to note one thing and that is you submitted four amendments on time. Um, and then you submitted 15 amendments late, and we allowed that, and we have sat here and listened to you, and I would just ask that in the future that you make a better effort to get the amendments in on a reasonable time. So uh, having said that, I now am proud you. to, to uh, yield to my new colleague from Massachusetts, um, who I admire greatly, uh, Ms. Presley, for any testimony you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of my amendment to H.R. 1. Throughout my life, I have abided by the mantra, we should never make assumptions about who desires to have a stakehold in and a seat at the table of our democracy. I do believe that if my amendment is enacted, that it will serve to re-engage, re-enfranchise, and recognize those in our democracy that are too often ignored, left out, and left behind. I am here tonight, however, because across this nation, young people are leading the way, which has been the case for every social movement throughout our history. They are organizing and mobilizing and calling us to action, making plain the high stakes the next generation faces, from gun violence to climate change to the future of work to the solvency of Social Security. Activist leaders like 17-year-old Vickiana, a constituent of mine and a student at Boston Latin who has been at the forefront of the March for Our Lives movement to stem the tide of gun violence. It is young people like Vickiana who march, organize, and remind us daily in the, house, in the halls of this institution what's at stake and just how high those stakes are. Since the days of abolitionists, suffragists, and civil rights activists, young people have been pushing the wheels of progress forward. These youth, our young people, who will inherit the nation we design here by virtue of our policies or by default of our policies and authority, these very same young people should also have a say in who represents them. For your consideration, Amendment Number 127, which would lower the minimum voting age in federal elections from 18 to 16 years of age. At the age of 16, our young people have the opportunity and awesome responsibility to drive a vehicle, to gain employment, and even to pay taxes. In fact, According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2018, nearly 2 million young people between the ages of 16 and 17 were employed, contributing to our labor, force, our labor force to their communities, their local economy, by paying taxes. And to be clear, this is not simply enhancing income, this is critical income to the stabilizing of households. And although I'm introducing this amendment, I'm not the first to broach this idea. As is so often the case, history repeats itself particularly when we do not learn from it. In fact, 
49 years ago to this very week, on March 7th, 1970, Senator Ted Kennedy argued before his colleagues in a subcommittee of the United States Senate in favor of lowering the voting age from 21 to 18 as an effort to, quote, bring our youth into full and lasting participation in our institutions of democratic government, unquote. To remind you contextually of where we found ourselves at the time we were in the midst of the Vietnam War, a fundamental question was being asked. The fact that our young people were old enough to fight in a war thousands of miles away, but were not old enough to have their voices heard in our democracy by casting a vote. One would argue that we are at a critical moment in time, a very similar crossroads as a nation, at a time where our young people are at the forefront of some of our most existential crises facing our communities and society at large. The time has come. Our young people deserve to have the opportunity to exercise their right to vote. We celebrate them often and lift them up as foot soldiers of movements. We thank them for their sweat equity that they expend at the forefront of change. And they should also have the opportunity to be respected and celebrated as ballot casters. I hope you will join me in extending the full promise of a representative government to the up and coming generation. Our youth are not only the future, they are the present. I respectfully request your support for amendment number 127, and I thank representatives Ming and Schakowsky for their leadership for leading on this critical issue. Well, thank you very much. And maybe I go, go to Ms. Meng next. Are you going to speak on this amendment as well? Yes. Okay, what, what if I go to you and next? Two others, please. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and the entire committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on my amendments 127, 131, and 175, which I've submitted for your consideration to HR 1, the For the People Act. I'm also grateful to your staff for their hard work on HR 1. I also want to thank Representatives Sarbanes and Speaker Pelosi for their leadership uh, in crafting this landmark legislation. I want to first speak on Amendment 127, which I submitted with our great new freshman representative, Ayanna Presley. This amendment uh, would lower the voting age to 16 years old. 16 and 17 year olds are legally permitted to work. They also pay federal income taxes on their earnings, and they are permitted to drive motor vehicles. It is only right and fair to allow 16 and 17 year olds a voice in our democracy. That's why I have separately introduced H.J. Resolution 23, a constitutional amendment that would also lower the voting age to 16 years old. Throughout our nation's history, from the Vietnam War era movements that sparked the 26th Amendment to the Parkland students who reignited the gun violence prevention movement, the power of youth activism has profoundly impacted social and political movements in the United States, and it's time their votes count too. I have also submitted two additional amendments, 131 and 175, both of which would ensure greater cultural competency with respect to poll worker training. The first of these two amendments would ensure that poll workers' training manuals include strategies to assist voters in culturally competent manners, paying special attention to voters with diverse needs and backgrounds, including voters who have limited English proficiency. My final amendment would include a reporting of cultural competency training that was carried out in the poll worker training. H.R. 1 is a historic bill that allows us the opportunity to expand voting rights uh, for all U.S. citizens. My amendments to lower the voting age and to strengthen poll worker diversity training will do just that. Thank you again for the opportunity to come before your committee. Thank you very much. Mr. Ruda, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Speak in the mic. Uh, the whole committee. I have six amendments I'd like to offer up, and I'll be very brief on all six. Amendment number five is digital ad disclosure. This amendment ensures that all social networks, ad networks, and search engines who sell political advertisements are subject to the transparency rules outlined in HR 1, primarily by lowering the monthly site visits from current number of 50 million down to 5 million, uh, which will help ensure that those that try to peddle fake news uh, would be prevented by doing so by appro providing appropriate transparency. 
Amendment number 87, political ad nationality disclosure. This amendment attempts to halt potential foreign election interference by mandating that the residency of political advertisement buyers be made available to the public. Amendment number 89, social media companion ads. This amendment ensures that political audio advertisements which feature a graphic companion advertisement are subject to the same honest ad disclosure rules. Bottom line, is the, the legislation right now covers videos. This picture and audio with a still uh, photo, it too should be covered uh, under the bill. Amendment number 91 is recycled paper ballots as we move across the country to greater use of mail-in ballots and paper ballots, a request that we use recycled paper since it emits 40% fewer greenhouse gases, uses 26% less energy, and creates 43% less water waste than non-recycled paper. Amendment number 93, study to optimize ballot design. Although some progress has been made since Florida's bad ballot design gained national attention in 2000 when Americans became unwilling experts on butterfly ballots and hanging chads, we still likely lose hundreds of thousands of votes every election year due to poor ballot design and instructions. Uh, our hope here is that we would simply continue to address this by having a proper committee uh, and investigative work look into how to make sure we have the best ballots we can have for American voters. Amendment number four, adding voter changes to the United States Postal Service form. It's just simply putting a moniker at the bottom of the change, uh, reminding people when they move to change their voter registration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Ruta. Thank you all for, for being here. I appreciate it very much. And, um, and let me just say for the record, Mr. President, Ms. Meng, I agree with your amendment uh, lowering the voting age to 16. Um, you know, I hope we can make it in order, and I hope, it's, I hope if we do, it will pass. But uh, I have no questions, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Cole. I do have one question uh, for Mr. Davidson, most of whose amendment I support. I hope they're made in order. But I'm thinking particularly of uh, your amendment number 29, and I agree with you. I'm not particularly fond of making Election Day a federal holiday, but uh, you're from the state of Ohio. Do you really want to move an election in November to Saturday <laughs> when Ohio State's playing or to Sunday when Cincinnati and Cleveland are playing? Well, every, every day that we pick has a challenge. And in Ohio, we have a very generous uh, early voting uh, provision that you can go in person and vote early, but uh, unlike some jurisdictions are accused of, you can never vote often. Have, have you talked to Mr. Stivers about this? Because I guarantee you his guys are tailgating at that, uh, at that Ohio well, State game. Th there will inherently be, be some folks that are affected by this. However, through, uh, through work weeks, first shift workers, third shift workers, there's no perfect time to have an election. And frankly, the amendment was offered before I think the, the committee rightly decided uh, to adopt a manager's amendment that does not add uh, to the federal holidays, which frankly disproportionately advantages government workers and disproportionately right. advantages small private sector employers. For the record, we'll make the point. I represent the University of Oklahoma and Norman. I know what this would do to my vote. Turnout, so I, uh, this is going to go on record as vociferously against anything that uh, interferes with college Saturday football. football. On Saturday, so. Fair point. All uh, right. Yeah. So that's all. Mr. Chairman, yield back. Mr. Perlmutter. A couple comments. Uh, one on Mr. Davidson's amendment about the states that have good uh, per capita voting. Uh, Colorado was second only to Minnesota in this past election, and uh, I don't know how we lost to Minnesota because I thought we beat them. Uh, but there's a certain allure uh, to that amendment, and i got to think about it a little bit. To the 16-year-old um, voters, uh, I, was, I endorsed a 16-year-old uh, voting for the city of Golden, so where I live, and um, supported it. We got clobbered in that election, 65% uh, to 35%. So I got to think twice about that. I, su I generally support the concept, but it, obviously um, my constituents were not particularly crazy. And this is a college town. Um, so um, I got to think a little bit about that particular amendment. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too, just want to comment on the, Ms. Presley's amendment. I remember very well the day that that 
changed. It was just a few weeks after my 21st birthday that all those damn, I mean, all those darn 18-year-olds got to vote and, and diluted my voting streak. But I, I, I appreciate the sincerity with which the amendment was offered and uh, the fact that taxes are collected from that age group without representation is, uh, is I think, an important one, and I hope the chairman will make that in order. Uh, Mr. Davies, let me just ask you a question on the provisional ballot and be sure that I understand this correctly. And I probably should have asked this question to our other panel, but I was already uh, up against some time constraints. Are all provisional ballots now to be counted regardless? Uh, there is a requirement to collect provisional ballots. Uh, states like Texas uh, do things different than states like California. And in state of California, if someone votes in the wrong precinct, let's say they happen to be on business and uh, say, oh, I didn't remember to vote. In California, they could be in San Francisco, but be a resident of Los Angeles and vote and still have that counted. And then it's incumbent upon that Board of Elections not just to rightly count the ballot, but to say, oh, well, you were eligible to vote. You filled out the whole ballot, which you shouldn't have, but we're going to go through the ballot and say, all right, well, you could vote for governor and you can vote for senator, for example, but you can't vote for the member of Congress from San Francisco because you're registered in Los Angeles. Uh, in Texas, they don't have that conflict, so my amendment would let states uh, stay in control of their elections. Uh, the only reason I bring it up is I, I actually cast a provisional ballot one time. I was... I just moved, and I thought I was in a school district that was having an election. And turned out I was in a school district that wasn't having an election. They couldn't find my name on the rolls. Of course, they were significantly upset and embarrassed that a member of Congress was showing up to vote. They couldn't find his name on the roll. And they let me cast a provisional ballot. Three or four weeks later, I got the ballot back in the mail and said, I actually was supposed to vote in the Aubrey Independent School District, which didn't have an election that day. I wasn't voting in the Pilot Point Independent School District, and my ballot was discounted. There's nothing that would have counted that ballot in, in currently in HR 1, is there? Uh, there is not supposed to be a provision that would have counted. This would just simply let states stay in control of their uh, election process. I, so I, I Texas could do point. it the way they want to. It doesn't end the requirement to collect provisional ballots. It just doesn't require that it's done the way that someone in Washington, D.C. decided they should do it. Correct. And, and that's... And I think that's the point. And, and so, I, again, great amendment. I think it is important that we include that Thank you. in our final report. Thank you. I'll yield back. Ms. Scanlon, or any questions? Mr. Morelli? Uh, Ms. Lesko? Ms. Shalala? Um, Mr. Chairman, I have long favored 16-year-olds to be able to vote. And having watched the Parkland Right. kids and their magnificent leadership, uh, I want to lend my support uh, to any amendment that supports 16-year-olds. Uh, Mr. Desaigne, no further questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you yeah. Mr. Meadows, you get the whole table to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and after Mr. Meadows, we have Mr. Burgess and Ms. Lesko who have amendments you want to testify on. And uh, Mr. Hastings as well. Anybody else up here? All right, but we'll let Mr. Meadows. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee, thank you for your intestinal fortitude to be here through so many different amendments. Uh, Mr. Hastings, a point of personal privilege, I just want to let you know I'm continuing to pray for you and praying for good health, my friend. Um, uh, I, I want to make two real quick comments on uh, the amendment that Mr. Davidson uh, had spoken to you about just briefly, uh, just some concerns as a co-sponsor of those two amendments, just encouraging for their inclusion. And I guess the, the, the biggest thing for me is to look at uh, really what I want to focus on is the subtitle A and subtitle B on the campaign finance oversight. Uh, you know, when you, when you read through the bill, it, it brings up great concerns when you start looking at, I believe, unintended consequences of things that are in this particular bill. Uh, for exa example, the uh, um, changing in uh, in subtitle A, changing the bipartisan uh, FEC commission to a partisan five-member commission. 
uh, is is very problematic. And, and I can't imagine that my Democrat friends that are here tonight would want to see a headline that says, Democrats vote to give Donald Trump the ability to choose the FEC chairman. But that, in fact, is what this bill does. And, and to take the FEC from a bipartisan six-member panel to a partisan five-member panel where the president is, is picking the FEC chairman, um, I, I, I don't think it's good government. And I would just encourage all of you to look at that. Uh, the amendment that Mr. Davidson and I put forth strikes that particular provision. And, and whether it's Donald Trump in the White House or Barack Obama, I think we all believe that campaign finance issues should be handled in a nonpartisan way. And this particular bill does not really encourage that. Um, going further then on, on subtitle B, it really gets to the, the heart of the coordination issue. And all of us, as we look at, at what is happening in terms of super PACs and, and finances, um, subtitle B of the, fi uh, the campaign finance aspect actually goes into uh, the standard for what coordination means. And, and gentlemen I, and, and ladies, I, I really am very, very concerned that what we're doing in this particular bill is, is actually making a coordination standard that is so low that anyone that comes to our office, whether it be a union leader or whether it be a lobbyist or anyone else, I mean, uh, it, it becomes a coordinating activity. Uh, was subject to fines, and so you couple that with the partisan nature of subtitle A, and what we have are a number of, of areas in this particular bill where the very essence of people coming advocating on policy becomes a campaign violation. I don't think that that's what the authors of this bill intended, but those two uh, amendments would be amendments that I would encourage the committee to make an order and hopefully have the support in a bipartisan way to, to actually help perfect that. Those would be amendments 165 and 166, and if this committee would consider that, I think that would be a step in the right direction. Uh, I would also ask unanimous consent that uh, a letter that we have uh, from the Associated Builders and Contractors uh, be made part of the record. It's in their oppositions and concerns to some of the provisions that are in H uh, HR 1. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, lastly, trying to speed through this, I have three amendments that I'll go, go over very, very quickly. One is amendment number 39, which is the Super PAC Elimination Act. Uh, it's a bill that we actually introduced uh, last Congress that we think that would be a, a good part of this package. It actually provides for transparency. It allows for the cap to be uh, done away with on individual uh, contributions, but what it does is allows for immediate uh, acknowledgement, 24 hour acknowledgement of those that are making campaign contributions. I think what it does for all of us is actually eliminate super PAC by the very nature of the fact that we have full disclosure and it comes to an individual candidate. I think all of us, well, maybe not all of us in this room, but many of us have experienced those super PACs that come in and do spending that we have no uh, ability to either support or not support because we're not coordinating. This would essentially uh, have a, a way through transparency to eliminate that, and I would encourage that. The last two uh, really are uh, amendments that uh, go to the heart of the voter registration aspect of this. Um, and uh, it would be amendment number 40 and uh, amendment number 41. Here's my concern. Uh, when we look at the census data and we look at people voting, and, and, and this is as of the 2016 uh, election, 4.4% of the people didn't vote because of registration issues. To go, go beyond that and say that uh, all voter registration needs to be automatic. What you're taking is is a really away from our privacy aspect. When you have a voter registration role, that is public information. To suggest that it's mandatory and automatic, all of a sudden what you're doing is taking everybody's um, registration and, and putting it out there. Now, 
there, uh, I would think that this is something that progressives and conservatives can come together on when we talk about privacy and, and where we fight with that. And so um, my encouragement would be to uh, uh, look at eliminating that. The other is uh, the same-day registration. We actually have same-day registration in North Carolina through early voting, but the day of, uh, we do not have that. Um, to, to take a standard, if we're going to make a federal standard, then, then we need to look at, at more than just voter registration. I, I, I find it just uh, ripe for fraud. And being from North Carolina, we, we can understand a, a little bit about what's happened in terms of, of fraud. But if we're going to set a national standard, then why do we not set a national standard for ballot harvesting as well? What's legal in California is not legal in North Carolina, and yet we seem to ignore that and then want to go on same-day registration. So for all those reasons, I would encourage the adoption and inclusion of these amendments and to stand open for questions from this esteemed body. Thank you, Mr. Ducano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Cole. I'm here to join my colleagues in support of H.R. 1, the Florida People Act. This legislation represents a bold, uh, a series of bold reforms that will give power back to the American people. Um, the For the People Act will help strengthen our democracy by enhancing voter protections to ensure that every American can exercise his or her right to vote, uh, combat the influence of money in politics that silences the voices of the, of the people, and fights for the culture, and fights the culture of corruption in Washington by bringing greater accountability and ethics to our political process. Today, I want to build on this significant piece of legislation and strengthen safeguards against the undue influence of money in politics by amending it to include the legislative changes proposed in my Let It Go Act. This bipartisan amendment, which I am proud to say is co-sponsored by Representatives Raskin, Belarakis, and Castor, complements the legislative intent of H.R. 1 by limiting the use of campaign funds after a campaign is ended. At this moment, there are no laws limiting uh, how long political candidates and former government officials can hold on to their surplus campaign funds after their campaign ends or the conclusion of their public service. In 2018 alone, several members of Congress retired with millions of dollars remaining in their campaign accounts, many of whom will not be seeking elected office in the future, while others turned to Washington's revolving door and became powerful, well-connected lobbyists. Recent reporting has also exposed how so-called zombie campaign, um, campaigns or campaign accounts um, misuse surplus funds for personal benefit, and, stress the, and it, this stresses the urgency of why this change in campaign finance law is needed. There have been, for example, instances when even after a government official uh, has passed away, their campaign accounts have remained active. Limits to how long surplus funds can remain in campaign accounts and how long that money can be utilized must be established. Political candidates and former government officials should not be using uh, surplus campaign funds for personal benefit or to exert undue influence on the political process. It's, that, it's not their money. They should let it go. The Let It Go Act would establish a practical and fair way to resolve campaign donations when they are no longer needed. This amendment would require that after six years since the uh, end of a campaign or a candidate's tenure in office, his or her campaign committee would need to make a reasonable attempt to return donations to its donors, donate the money to charity, or send the funds to another uh, political committee. Additionally, anyone registered to become a lobbyist would be required to resolve their campaign accounts within one year of enactment. Money in politics is disrupting, pro is disrupting progress weakening our voting power and influencing elected officials to act against the well-being of the country. H.R. 1 will help shift the balance of power from a wealthy, uh, powerful few back to the American people. Achieving this objective will be reinforced by including the Let It Go Amendment in this progressive piece of legislation. I urge the committee and my colleagues to support this sensible campaign reform effort. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Appreciate you both being here. Um, Mr. Hastings, any questions? I have no question. Mr. Cole? No anybody on my, our side? Anybody on Mr. Burgess or Mr. Lesko? Mr. Burgess. I just say Mr. Meadow, I think, brings an important point to the committee, and I hope we'll look favorably on his amendment and make it an order. Okay. okay. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming. No, it's nice to see you. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I think we have some members of the Rules Committee that need to want to testify. Uh, Mr. Hastings. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, at the time, I'd ask you yeah. now yeah. consent in my yeah. statement in support of my amendment, uh, which deals with uh, penmanship, uh, be made part of the record. Without, with a, without objection. Um, yeah. uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to also insert in the record a statement by Representative Kathleen Rice uh, in support of her amendment and one by Mr. Gottheimer in support of uh, his amendment. As well. and, uh, and Mr. Nagoose has a statement I'd like to support for the uh, in, um, insert for the record. Uh, Mr. Cole. Uh, actually, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement from Mr. Duncan of South Carolina regarding uh, his amendment, uh, amendment number two to Without H.R. Objection. 1. That's my only request. Okay. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the spirit of uh, what's been offered, I have two amendments, 67 and 68, and I ask unanimous consent that my statements be without, included. Without objection. Any, anybody on this side? No? Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, several amendments. I'll be very brief. Uh, the LESCO number uh, 103 amendment strikes the requirement for states to treat mail-in voter registration the same as online voter registration and allows states to set their own requirements for the use of online and Internet voter registration as, be, as may be necessary to ensure security and to prevent fraudulent registrations. I just believe, as was stated before, that states uh, do a better job at uh, conducting elections than a federal bureaucracy. Uh, let's go uh, number 100 amendment, uh, strike subtitle B of Title V relating to the My Voice voucher pilot program and the six to one um, public financing match for small contributions. Um, as I've stated before, I do not believe that we should be using pu public money for uh, candidates' campaigns, uh, and most of my constituents object to that. Let's go number 104 amendment, strike subtitle E of Title II relating to independent redistricting commissions. Again, I believe the states um, are better equipped to know how to decide their redistricting lines in the state of Arizona. The voters uh, decided about our independent redistricting commission and how it would run. And, um, you know, I just think that states are in better place to determine these than the federal government. Let's go number 105 amendment allows a state to remove the name of a voter from a voter list if the state has reason to believe that the voter is another is registered in another state is fraudulently registered or is an illegal alien. I believe we need to uphold the integrity of our election system. Thank you very much. Are there any other members uh, who wish to testify in this legislation? Please lock the door. No, seeing none, this, this closes the hearing portion um, of our meeting. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, at this time, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 1, the For the People Act of 2019, a structured rule. The rule provides two hours of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on House administration. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee print 116-7, modified by the amendment printed in Part A of the Rules Committee report, shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule makes in order only those further amendments printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report and amendments on block described in Section C 3 of the rule. Each such amendment printed in Part B of the report may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part B of the report, 
or against amendments on block as described in Section 3 of the rule. The chair of the Committee on House Administration or her designee may offer amendments on block at any time consisting of amendments not earlier disposed of. Amendments on block shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on House Administration or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. The rule provides after the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, a final period of general debate which shall not exceed 10 minutes, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on House Administration. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Finally, the rule provides that it shall be in order at any time through the legislative day of March 8, 2019, for the Speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules as though under Clause 1 of Rule 15, and that the Speaker or her designee shall consult with the Minority Leader or his designee on the designation of any matter for consideration pursuant to this section. Uh, thank you very much. As we've just heard from the gentleman from Pennsylvania, uh, this rule provides for consideration of H.R. 1 for the uh, People Act, uh, for the People Act under a structured rule. The rule itself executes the Rules Committee print and a manager's amendment. The rule makes an order 72 amendments, each debatable for 10 minutes. It also provides on block authority. Uh, since this is a major piece of legislation, the rule provides, two, provides for two hours of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking member of the House, administra uh, House Administration to provide members with more time to speak on the bill. The rule provides 10 additional minutes of debate after consideration of amendments. Finally, the rule provides suspension authority for uh, Thursday, March 7th and Friday, March 8th. Uh, and uh, uh, there, um, you've heard the motion from the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. Uh, is there any amendment or discussion? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Cole. thank you very much. I have three amendments to the desk. Uh, may I offer one now? Absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I move to postpone consideration of the resolution until March 12th. This issue, frankly, is too important to rush forward. And while technically complying with the new rules of the House, to check all the boxes and to say that this process is regular order is, in my view, disingenuous at best. I'm particularly concerned in this case that we are literally changing the election systems of 50 states. Uh, I don't think any of them have had very much time to consider this or to communicate any concerns they might have or costs that they might incur uh, to their the members of their respective delegations. The amendment will allow the Office of the Parliamentarian uh, the opportunity to adjudicate claims by the Energy and Commerce Committee regarding jurisdiction and allow for other committees with jurisdiction to mark up provisions under their ju uh, jurisdiction. I, uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, uh, is there any discussion uh, or, um, to the gentleman's uh, amendment? Um, I just want to say one thing. I mean, again, just remind everybody that this uh, bill was introduced on January 3rd. We're now in March. So it's, people have had ample, ample time to read it. The bill has uh, had not one but five hearings, uh, totaling 15 hours. We've had many hours of listening to the uh, uh, witnesses here today, um, and I just will point out again for the record that uh, by way of a little bit of contrast here, uh, when my friends were in charge, their HR1, uh, uh, which showered tax uh, benefits on the wealthiest in this country, had zero hearings um, and zero expert witnesses, uh, and um, no amendments were made in order, and it cost the taxpayers $1.5 trillion. This bill costs nothing. So I think you know, I mean, look, we always can do better, but I think this process has been good, um, and I would urge a no vote on the gentleman's um, amendment. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, Ms. Shalala. Just want to point out, I, looking at the committees um, that had full hearings and counting the number of members, almost a third of the House had an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to discuss the bill in their committee hearings. I Appreciate that. And again, I mean, I think we have a difference of opinion on how we should proceed, and you know, sometimes that happens. But anyway, uh, you've heard the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no. 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 In, the, in the opinion of the chairs, no have it. Like a roll call? Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalala? No. Ms. Shalala votes no. Mr. Desaunier? No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall? Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko? Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Can we report the total? 
Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment does not agree to any other amendments. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've got an amendment to the rule. Move the committee provide an additional two hours of general debate on H.R. 1, one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking uh, Republican member of the committee on oversight and reform, and one hour equally divided and controlled uh, by the chair and ranking Republican uh, on the committee on the judiciary. Uh, again, the short-circuited pro process by the Democratic majority failed to allow either the committees on oversight and reform or the committee on the judiciary, both of which have significant jurisdiction uh, to mark up this legislation. This amendment would at least allow these committees the opportunity to debate the merits of the legislation on the House floor. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I think I, with all the amendments that are going to be made in order, I guarantee that we'll have uh, a lot more than four hours of debate on, on this matter, and so um, I would urge a no vote. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, the vote is on the, the member for the gentleman from Oklahoma. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Union chair, the noes have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalila. No. Ms. Shalila votes no. And Mr. Desaunier. No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Any other amendment, Mr. Cole? One, one further amendment, Mr. Chairman, from me. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, got an amendment to the rule. I move the committee grant a modified open rule to H.R. 1 with a requirement that all amendments be received for printing in a uh, portion of the congressional record dated at least one day before the day of consideration of the amendment. Again, due to the hasty committee process uh, that prevented committees with major jurisdiction from marking up H.R. 1, uh, this is an ideal candidate for a modified open rule. For this reason, members uh, should be afforded the opportunity to amend the legislation on the House floor. I'm going, to I'm going to oppose the gentleman's amendment, but I'll also point out for the record, I don't think there was a single modified open rule in the last Congress. But uh, having said that, uh, members should vote their conscience on this. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, you heard the, uh, uh, the uh, amendment for the gentleman from Oklahoma. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Aye. Opinion chair, the noes have it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Ms. Shalala votes no. Mr. Desaunier. Aye. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agree to any further amendments. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three uh, motions. Uh, uh, I'd like to make an amendment to the rule of move to strike the text of Rules Committee Print 116-7 uh, and insert the text as reported by the Committee on House Administration. You saw the disagreement among the Chairman and Ranking Member about what was in uh, the uh, Rules Committee Print, what's in the uh, manager's amendment. There's only been one hearing on this bill, one markup. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one markup on this bill. Uh, only one CBO score on this bill. That has been uh, the product that came out of the House Administration uh, Committee, uh, allowing the uh, Rules Committee to bring only what was marked up in committee uh, to the floor would provide an opportunity for all of the other committees of jurisdiction uh, to have their yeah. voice heard on the floor. Well, as the gentleman knows, there were multiple hearings, but if the gentleman got his way, uh, as he knows, all the amendments that have been offered, including Republican amendments or the bipartisan amendments, have been drafted to this print. And so it would invalidate all those amendments and basically mess the whole process up. So I would urge a no vote. If, if the chairman would yes, like sir. to reconsider the, Mr. Cole's modified open rule amendment, I would yeah. be happy to ask. <laughs> that. I think we've, we've, we've had that debate. And, uh, um, and uh, again, I point out that I don't recall a single modified open rule. Uh, when you were in charge of this place. But anyway, the, the, the vote is now on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Aye. Opinion chair, the noes have it. Hey, Mr. Chairman, can I get a roll call vote, yeah. uh, The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalila. No. Ms. Shalila votes no. Mr. Desaunier. Mr. Tony votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee uh, uh, provide 20 minutes of debate under the control of the majority leader and the minority leader. 
uh, or their designees on the constitutionality of this uh, legislation prior to debate. Uh, you may recall the leader protocol in the last uh, Congress uh, that uh, provided that opportunity uh, when members requested a debate on the constitutionality. Uh, certainly there's no uh, shortage of folks making the uh, attestation that the federal overreach here approaches those constitutional uh, boundaries. Uh, groups from across the political uh, spectrum, from Heritage to the ACLU, have, uh, have said as much and providing uh, modest uh, 20 minutes of debate on the constitutionality uh, seems like the, uh, the least we can do in a For the People uh, bill. Yeah, well, as the gentleman knows, uh, when this bill was introduced, it was introduced with a constitutional authority statement, um, and uh, as every bill is uh, is required to have. And, um, you know, you could have two hours to debate this, a uh, general debate. You could, uh, so uh, I would urge no vote. Uh, any other discussion on the Woodall Amendment? Hearing none, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can no. you chair the noes have it? Uh, roll call, please. And the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mr. Torres. Mr. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala votes no. Mr. Gisonier. No. Mr. Gisonier votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Order report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment days. is not agreed to. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make an amendment that the rule make in order amendment number 126 offered by Mr. Buck of Colorado, amendment number 130 offered by Mr. Calvert of California, and amendment number 135 offered by Mr. Gozar of Arizona. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, these amendments all comply with the House rules, uh, and nothing should preclude them from being offered uh, on the floor. You have actively uh, uh, tried to uh, make uh, uh, amendments in order that uh, do not contain any points of order or budgetary issues. Uh, these amendments contain no points of order, uh, no budgetary issues that would require waivers. And so in an effort to continue that open and fair process that uh, you have begun, I would ask that they may be Appreciate made in order and, and open to discussion. Any discussion on the, on the Woodall Amendment? Hearing none, the vote is on the Woodall Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Can you chair the noes have it? Want a roll call? Roll call. Roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalila. No. Ms. Shalila votes no. Mr. Desaunier. No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. The court report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Woodall, you, you done with amendments? No. Okay. All right. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have two amendments. The first is amendment number 67. This amendment requires a speaker of the House 15 days after elected as speaker to submit a copy of individual tax returns for the past 10 years to the Federal Election Commission. I'm not certain that I agree with the principle of requiring the release of the President's and Vice President's tax returns, but if you're going to go down that road, it seems to make sense that a constitutional office like the Speaker should also comply with that. So I'd ask consideration of my amendment. Uh, you heard the gentleman's amendment. Any debate or discussion? Hearing none, the voters on the Burgess Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 And you chair the noes have it? No. Okay. The, uh, the uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Yes. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli votes no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala votes no. Mr. Desaunier. No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. Uh, no. Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will uh, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Not agreed to. Mr. Burgess. Yes, uh, amendment number 68. Uh, continuing in this same arena, um, perhaps. And again, I'm not sure that I agree with the principle of requiring the president and vice president to disclose their taxes. However, if we are going to go down that road, perhaps we should require that of every member and of the United States House of Representatives and candidates for the House of Representatives. I will admit, when I ran for office, Texas has an early primary. I just filed my income taxes at great burden and expense. 
And then I was suddenly faced with this disclosure form that I'd never seen before. Uh, it was difficult to fill it out. It dealt in ranges and not in specifics. It seems to me it would be very straightforward to simply require, if we're going to go down the road of requiring taxes from the president, vice president, we should require them of every single member of Congress and every candidate for Congress. Uh, ask, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, amendment. Um, and, um, you know, I think I just, it's interesting that during eight years, um, that you were in charge that none of this ever got brought up. But I'm, I'm also puzzled why the Senate Majority Leader is not included in your, uh, in, in requiring the. Again, yeah, for the previous amendment, it's not a constitutional office. If we wish to go down the line of pro -tem? presidential. The Senate pro tem? Pres yes, if we wanted to go down the list. Okay, well, and then well, every member of Congress no, eventually. No, no, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think next time we will work with you on the, on the amendment. Uh, but for now, I will oppose it. And I. Urge a no vote. All those in favor of the Burgess Amendment say aye. Aye. Oppose no. 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 In your chair, the noes have it. Want a roll call? Yes, sir. Uh, clerk will call, call, call the roll. We're not going to do what we're asking yeah. the president to do. No, we we got to have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Murley. No. Mr. Murley votes no. Ms. Shalila. Mr. Shalila votes no. Mr. Desaunier. No. Mr. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Yes. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Uh, I vote aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. Before I say no, I'll say there's nothing that prevents any of us from releasing our taxes. So um, uh, I will vote no. Mr. Chairman votes no. Uh, the clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Members not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Burgess, uh, please, uh, any further amendments? Your amendments? Yes. Okay, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, so that we can go faster, I'm going to combine mine together. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule to make an order. Amendment number 104 and amendment number 105 offered by myself, uh, Mrs. Lesko. As a reminder, 104 strikes subtitle E of Title II relating to independent redistricting commissions. I think the states know better how to do this. Number five allows the state to remove the name of a voter from a voter list if the state has a reason to believe the voter is registered in another state, is fraudulently registered, or is an illegal alien. You heard the general lady's uh, amendments. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, the voters on the Lesko Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Aye. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings votes no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres votes no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter votes no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Ras Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Murley. Yeah. Mr. Murley votes no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala votes no. Mr. Desaunier. No. Ms. Desaunier votes no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Uh, is there any other amendment or discussion? Oh, uh, the, you need, I re, I clerk report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. The noes have it, sorry. Uh, the members did not agreed to. Uh, is there any other amendment or discussion? Uh, let me just say that uh, I know that we've had a vigorous uh, uh, discussion here in the Rules Committee, uh, but I think this is a, uh, an important bill. I want to thank uh, Mr. Sarbanes for introducing it. Uh, this is about uh, ending the dominance of big money in politics. It's about uh, protecting the right to vote for every single American, and it's a, and it crack, cracks down on corruption and, uh, and makes sure that public servants uh, put the public interest ahead of their uh, ahead, of spe ahead of special interests. And I uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, 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 this passing on the House floor. And I think uh, most people in this country, no matter what their political party is, I think what we're doing is right. And uh, the only thing that they're concerned about is it took us so long to get here. So. Uh, having said that, uh, the, the, the question now is on the motion offered by the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Torres votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Murley. Aye. Mr. Murley votes aye. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Ms. Shalala votes aye. Mr. Desaunier. 
Mr. Tassani votes aye. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole votes no. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall votes no. Mr. Burgess? No. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Burgess votes no. Mrs. Lesko? No. Mrs. Lesko votes no. Mr. Chairman? Proudly aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. Clerk report the total. Nine yeas, nine yeas, four nays. And the motion is, is agreed to it. <coughs> Ms. Hamlin from Pennsylvania will handle this for the uh, majority. Okay. And Mr. Cole from Oklahoma will handle it for the minority. So uh, I guess that's it. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do I need it? No. I got plenty. That was quite happens. the effort on the first panel. Give it away to the press. That wraps up tonight's House Rules Committee meeting looking at H.R. 1, a bill related to voting rights, campaign finance, and ethics. This measure is set to hit the House floor tomorrow at noon Eastern with debate continuing into Thursday and a final passage vote expected on Friday. Follow the debate live on C-SPAN when the House gavels in at 12 p.m. Eastern. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Live every day with news and policy issues that impact you.